Mark chapter 1, um, that's where we're going. We are in the last week of a series called Anchors. And um, we could have taken this like 10, 15, 20, like 30 more weeks. Like there's all kinds of topics that we can take and say, hey, these are things we need to be anchored to. Um, we're going to take some of those and, and I'll throw some of those into the next couple of series that we do to finish out the year. Um, but I didn't feel like we needed to just kind of belabor the point of, of anchors. And so we're going to move into something else, hopefully next week. Um, if I can work everything together, it'll start next week. If not, it'll, it'll week, be the week after, and then next week will kind of be a bridge sermon in between the two. Um, but quick review, um, we've been talking about for the past several weeks what we need to be anchored to in our walk with Jesus. And so we've taken all these things, and we're saying, hey, this is what Jesus modeled for us, and, and so this is, what we need to, this is what we need to anchor ourselves to. It's what we need to stand firm in our faith on. Uh, we've also talked about um, how being anchored to the wrong thing can hinder our walk with Jesus. If we're anchored in the wrong stuff, it, it, can, it can hinder our relationship with other people, and it can hinder us, it can stop us um, from being able to take our next step in our walk with Christ. And, and what we say around here all the time is Christianity is simply a series of next steps. And so we need to be anchored to the right things in order to be able to take those next steps. Week number one, we talked about being anchored in compassion. Um, and we said that, that compassion is greater than condemnation. For far too long, the church has spoken the message of condemnation, and we need to begin to show compassion. We need to let people know um, what we stand for. Now, everyone knows what we're against, but we really need to start standing and showing people what we're for, and that's Jesus Christ and the message of Jesus Christ. Uh, week number two, we talked about forgiveness, and, and we said being forgiving is much better than being bitter. Because when we're bitter, um, we're really just hurting ourselves. We're really not hurting the person that, that, that we won't forgive or the situation we won't forgive. And so forgiveness, we need to be anchored in that. Week number three, we kicked off an event here at church, 21 Days of Prayer. And for three weeks, we prayed every single day for the church, for the people in church, for our communities, for our schools, for our policemen, our firefighters, for our nation. And we went through all of that and we said, hey, prayer is communicating with God and we need to do that in order to have a healthy relationship, any relationship that we're in. There has to be communication. There has to be a time where we talk and there has to be a time when we, we listen. We said prayer is simply that, communicating with God. That's, that's it. And we need to be anchored into that. Um, then in week four, five, and six, we, we shifted gears a tad. We looked at one section of scripture. We went to Genesis 28, Genesis 29, um, and we looked at a guy named Jacob, and we talked about um, how he was anchored in God's grace, and we needed to be anchored in God's grace. And we said he was anchored in his giftings, and we said, hey, that's, that's what we need to do. We need to, be, we need to um, let God's giftings, the giftings that he's given us, flow out of us, and we need to pour into other people, and we need to be serving and then the last week we said we need to be anchored in generosity, um, that God was generous to us and he has been generous to us, not just in the fact that we can have eternal life through his son Jesus Christ, um, but everything that we have, every good thing that we have, um, every blessing that we have comes from God and we need to be generous in giving that back. Um, and so, so that's been the, the past several weeks. If you miss any of those messages, jump online and listen to those. Um, today we're going to finish this up by talking about salvation. And in order to set it up, I need to start out by talking about lost stuff, things that are lost. Like, I, I would imagine that everybody here, if I could say that there's one thing that's true about all of us, all of us have fears of losing something, right? Like, like I don't know about you, but I'm a parent. How many parents are here? Like, I have a fear of losing my kid. Any of you ever, has anybody ever lost their kid? Anyone want to be honest? And like, first service, everyone's like, no, man, I'm parent of the year. I don't want to admit to that. Like, we've lost both of ours at least once. Um, I'll tell you those stories, maybe. some They're horrible stories. They're awful. We're such bad parents. But we've lost each of our kids at least once. Um, but we all have a fear of losing something. And, and maybe, maybe it's not um, <laughs> a fear of losing a little person that you created. Um, maybe it's something a little bit more tangible, like your keys. Anybody ever anybody have a fear of losing their keys? Yeah. I, I, I don't have a fear of losing my keys anymore because I just leave everything unlocked. House is unlocked. Keys are in my truck all the time. I don't care. You want to steal it, go steal it. I got insurance. I'll get another one. Like, I'm tired of losing my keys and not having them, so it's just out there. Or how about not this one? How, this, this, so keys don't freak me out, but this next one does. Cell phone. Anybody freak out when you lose your cell phone? I lose my dang mind when I lose my cell phone because all the information in the world to me is on my stupid cell phone. I don't know anybody's number. Like, legit, I do not know what my wife's cell phone number is. Ask the staff. 
There have been times I've left my cell phone at home and I've had to ask them, hey, what's Mary's number so I can use the church phone to call them? Like, I don't know. And because I'm embarrassed of asking them anymore, it's written on the board in my office now. So it's in there. It's, <laughs> it's the police chief's number and Mary's. Like, those are the only two numbers I have written down in my office. I don't know the irony behind that or anything, but it's just both there. So I can't stand losing my cell phone. How about wallet? Anybody, like, lose your wallet, lose your mind? Yeah, I, I like that too, man. I would rather die than lose my wallet. I was talking to a guy one time. This is a true story. He was talking about getting robbed. He worked at a restaurant, and a guy came in with a knife, pulled out a knife on him, and said, give me all the money. And so he hit the cash register thing, and it popped open, and he gave him all the money. And, and then he said, give me your wallet. And I said, what'd you do? He said, I gave him my wallet. Now, see, that's where I'm out. That's where I draw the line. You ain't getting my wallet. You can have everything in my wallet. You can have all the cash. There is no cash because I'm married. You can have, like, all the boys be saying amen, right? Got my back on that one. She, she's right there, like, looking at me crazy. But she know it's true. And so <laughs> that's why I'm preaching over this side of the room now. <laughs> you could have, like, if there was cash, you could have all my cash. You could have all my credit cards. You could have my insurance card. But you're not getting, anyone want to guess what you're not getting? My driver's license, because I would rather you cut me with a knife than me have to stand in line to get another driver's license. The other day I was in there, I was trying to get the travel license. You guys have been through this yet? You got to get the license with a little star on it and everything? Like, I just, my kid was in there, he's getting a permit for a motorcycle, and I'm like, I just get, I'll just go ahead and do this driver's license thing right now. I had my driver's license, Right? I have the form of identification that the United States says is, 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 is allowed for everything, right? I'm giving you my driver's license. Oh, no, no, that's not good enough. You've got to have a social security card, passport, blood sample, COVID test. I, I don't, you got to have, like, all of this stuff. I'm like, no. So anyway, hate that. I hate the BMV and Walmart. Like, those are two places, like, if I can't help it, I ain't going. Anyway, get back on track. All of us have a fear of losing something, Right? So with that, and um, this is just from church experience, um, but some people, there's a thought in your mind from time to time, and in fact, I think every Christian, I do, I think every Christian wrestles with this from time to time, or if you're not a Christian, one of the things that maybe prevents you from becoming a Christian is this thought. What if I lost my salvation? What if I lose my salvation? Like, is it, is it possible for somebody who's received Jesus, for somebody who's had a genuine encounter, a genuine life change with Jesus, it, it, is it possible that you could do something or a series of somethings along your journey, and, and we could talk about the something or the series of somethings all morning long, but is it possible that there's something that you can do where eventually God will say, hey, I'm out, you're not my kid anymore. You're not a Christian anymore. You're not saved anymore. I want back what I have given you, away with you. I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. Like, is that, is, that, is that possibility there? Like, can that anchor be pulled up? And so today, we're just going to talk about, can a Christian, somebody who's truly met Jesus, somebody who, is, who has truly said, yes, Lord, I will follow you, can that person lose their salvation? Now, I'm going to do something that I normally don't do. I'm going to give you the answer right up front. So that way, um, there can either be a sigh of relief, or you can get mad at me. But either way, you, you know the answer. So I'm going to give you that so, so you can know where I stand on it, and then I'm going to spend the rest of our time unpacking it. Um, can a Christian, someone who's ever met Jesus, lose their salvation? The short answer is no. The long answer is heck no. They can't. Listen to me. Don't miss this. Once we are anchored in salvation, we are anchored in salvation. We, we, we just are. Now, some of you might come from church backgrounds that teach you you can lose your salvation, and I know somebody is going to argue. Somebody's going to say, but you don't understand. There's this passage in Hebrews 6, and Hebrews 6 says da-da-da-da-da. First of all, and, and this is just for a couple of people. This is for the online people. I know nobody in here. Um, this is for people that use Hebrews 6 as a you can lose your salvation passage. First of all, that verse does not say 
that that person or those people that are being talked about right there have had a salvation experience. They're not saying that they had a genuine encounter with Jesus. They're not saying that that person was ever called by Jesus. Second of all, if that verse says that you can lose your salvation, it says you can't get it back. And so that's pretty scary. And I wouldn't want to base my entire theology on one verse. That's dangerous. That's what heretic cult leaders on TV do. All right? and, and that's not where I want to be, and you don't want to go there either. You can't lose your salvation. Once you're anchored in salvation, you're anchored in salvation. And so I'm going to walk you through this today. I'm going to show you a story. I'm going to take you through a familiar, maybe familiar, maybe, maybe not familiar, but, but it's a passage um, where Peter denies Jesus. And we're going to look at some other scriptures before we get there. We're going to kind of go on a, on, a, on a Peter journey this morning, but we're going to get to a point where Peter denies Jesus. Before we do that, before we really dive in, let me give you a definition of sin. This is going to be kind of the working definition of sin um, that we use for this entire message. All right? I think it's easy. I think it's simple. I think all of us got, can remember this. Sin. Sin is nothing more than when you and I decide to deny Jesus. That's sin. Sin is when you and I decide to deny Jesus. Sin is something that when we say, hey, Jesus, I know what you want in my life, but instead of doing what you want me to do, I'm going to do what I want to do. So listen, dude, I'm going to take your will, I'm going to kind of put it aside, I'm going to do my own thing. Like, Jesus, I'm going to go do me. That's, that's what I'm going to do. Like, I'm going to do whatever I want. Jesus, I know what you say, but I'm going to do my thing. Sin is when you and I make a conscious decision to deny Jesus. I, I've had per- people say um, all the time, I've heard, yeah, you don't understand. I just fell into sin. No, you didn't. No, l- l- let's be honest. No one in this room has ever, you've never fallen into sin. You've never tripped and went, whoo, whoo, sin. You've never done that, ever. None of us fall into sin. Now, we all fall short of the glory of God, but none of us fall into sin. You and I, when we sin, we make a willful decision to sin every time. Peter, Peter sinned. Peter denied Jesus. He made a decision three times. Three times he said, I don't know him. I don't know him. On the third time, he calls on curses on himself. He's like, I don't know the dude. He, he made that decision to do that. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. If I'm Jesus and I'm sending anybody to hell, it's Pete. All right? I mean, he denied him three times did exactly what Jesus said that he was going to do. Like, Jesus called it all out. Peter's like, I'm going to do it, and and he did it. And so if I'm sending anybody, it's Peter. I'm so glad, aren't you, that Jesus doesn't treat people the way that we treat people sometimes. So with that in mind, let's walk through Peter's story. We're going to go through the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to look at some instances in Peter's life. And I want to walk you through why I believe that once we're anchored in salvation, we're anchored in salvation. Now listen, I want you to understand something. I've, spart, I've spent a large part of my Christian life researching this subject. My convictions are firm. All right? It's not just because I come from a Baptist background or anything like that. It's not this is what you've been taught and blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. Everything I teach up here, like I've studied through, all right? And I, and I stand firm on this one. And I want you to know, I'm going to say this. If I believe that you can lose your salvation, I'd pray the prayer of salvation like every five minutes. That's how big of a sinner I am, like legit. Like, I'd be constantly praying, please save me, please save me, please save me, please save me. Like, I, that's where I would be at, okay? Now, let me, let me also say this. If you're here and you come from a legalistic background, and, and the fact that I'm saying you can't lose your salvation, it bothers you right now, and you're getting mad at me, if that's you, I want you to know something. Jesus doesn't love us because of the rules. He doesn't. Jesus loves us because we received his payment for our sins on the cross. That's the only reason, because none of us deserve his love. I'll unpack that in a little bit. I just want to throw that out there. Mark chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Now, hold up. I don't have time to go into this today. You're going to have to take my word on this. I've, I've taught this before. The reason Peter was fishing was because he had been rejected by the religious system of the day. Back then, if you weren't good, like the, the, goal, the goal of a little boy was to be a rabbi or a teacher of the law, be, be one of those people, right? And so if you weren't good enough to be a rabbi, religious leader, teacher of the law, you went back, you were cut out of school, and, and you went back and you did what your dad did. 
All right, so if your dad made shoes, you, you became a shoemaker. Um, if your dad was a carpenter, you went back, you learned how to be a carpenter. If your dad was a, a fisherman, you went back and you were a fisherman. And so don't miss this. At some point, at some point in his schooling, at some point in his religious teaching, Peter didn't make the cut. At some point in his life, Peter was told by religious experts, hey, you're not good enough. At some point in his life, somebody looked at Peter and said, you're never going to make it in the religious world. What you need to do is you need to go back and you need to do and learn how to do what your daddy does. Well, obviously, Peter's dad was a fisherman. So Peter goes back and he learns how to fish. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm sure Peter, from time to time as he's fishing, As he's looking at the teachers of the law, and he's looking at the religious leaders, and he's looking at people doing things that maybe perhaps he wanted to do, I'm I'm sure he had this thought, I wasn't good enough. I wasn't good enough to make it. I'm sure he thought that. And and I want to throw this in here. If you're here and you're like, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough to receive Jesus, here's the truth. (laughs) You're right. You're not. You're not good enough to receive Jesus. I'm not good enough to receive us, receive Jesus. That's why salvation is called grace. He gives us what we don't deserve. It's the best deal going. Peter didn't deserve it. Peter did nothing to earn it. But here comes Jesus. Watch this. This is, this is so cool. Peter and his brother Andrew, they're out there fishing and they're doing this. And, and look what Jesus does. Verse 17, come, follow me. I love this. Love this. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. This is so, 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 so cool. Let, let, me, well, let me back up. Let me ask this question. This is, a, this is a church question, all right? This is a really easy church question. This is like me slow pitching you a softball, all right? You're about to knock this one out the park, all right? Everyone could get this right. When Jesus called Peter to follow him, did he know that eventually Peter was going to deny him three times, yes or no? Yes, absolutely he knew. And when he walked by the lake, when he looked at Peter, he didn't say, whoo, there's a man that's never going to mess up. There's a man who's always going to do what's right in my sight. Here's a man who's always going to follow me. Here's a man who will never deny me. Here's a guy that's got everything together. He didn't say that. I find it fascinating that Jesus sought out a man that the religious system told was not good enough, and he asked that guy to follow him. Listen, that should be encouraging to every one of us because Jesus is not searching for perfect people. He's not. I don't care what other churches have told you. I don't care what you've heard your entire life. Jesus is not searching for perfect people. Jesus is searching for people who are willing to follow him and give their very best effort knowing that those people, you and I, are going to go through periods where we sin and we deny Jesus. Isn't that crazy? Isn't it crazy that we're the people that he seeks out? Listen to me. Jesus Christ is not surprised by anything any of us do. God will never say to you or say to me, I can't believe you did that. God is not in heaven scratching his head going, can't figure that guy out. I just don't even understand that. God is not surprised by anything that you or I do or do not do. God, listen, he is outside of time. And so when he saves, don't miss this, when he saves us, he saves us completely completely. And when we receive payment for the sin that Jesus made for us on the cross, that's, that's payment for our sins past. It's payment for our sins present. And it's payment for our sins future. Jesus Christ completely saves. He does not do a halfway job. I do not serve a halfway God. I do not serve a God who only loves me on my good days. Because if I only served a God, if I served a God who only loved me on my good days, what kind of God would he be? Seriously. And so Jesus comes up to these guys, he finds them, and he looks at Peter and he says, come follow me, come follow me, and I will make, that's key, I will make. He's like, hey man, I got something for you. I got something that I'm going to put inside of you, that I'm going to develop inside, like I'm going to do a work inside of your life. The reason he told Peter that was because he understood Peter was a work in progress. He understood that Peter was going to have good days and Peter was going to have bad days. He understood there were going to be days when Peter was great and there were going to be days when Peter was going to struggle. He understood that Peter was going to go to the mountaintop, but Peter was also going to walk through the valley. He knew everything about Peter, and he still said, I want you to follow me. Listen to me. If you're a Christian, don't miss this. If you're a Christian, you're a Christian for one reason. At some point, at some point in your life, Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit, knocked on the door of your heart, and he asked you, 
to come and follow him. And when he saved you and when he saved me, he knew everything, every good thing, every bad thing, every stupid thing that we were ever going to do, and he was willing to save us anyway. That is salvation by grace, and not because you and I deserve it, not because we've earned it, it is grace. Peter didn't do anything. Peter didn't deserve it. Peter didn't even ask for it. Dude was fishing. He was doing something that the world told him that he should do, and Jesus walks by and says, I want you. I want you. I want you to come and follow me. Hey, it's okay. I know everything about you. I know everything that you're ever going to do. I know in three years you're going to deny me. I know in three years you're going to call down curses on yourself. But I don't care. I still want you to come and follow me. Because listen, Peter, I love you. And I believe in you. And that's what Jesus does when he saves us. He knows everything about us. And he still loves us anyway. Man, I love that. That's good news. I mean, seriously. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about that? That Jesus doesn't love you based on your performance? That Jesus doesn't base, love you based on what you start doing or what you stop doing? That Jesus just loves you, period? Like, that blows my mind. Look, look at this. Verse 18. He says, I love this. This is at once. At once. Not, 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 oh, let me think about it. Let me pray about it. Let me go ask my spouse about it. Let me ask everybody else about it. No. So that once, they left their nets and followed him. They're like, you know what? I've been told my entire life I wasn't good enough. Man, I worked hard through the religious. Man, I really wanted to do it, and, and I got cut. Yeah, man, I'll follow you. Here's my question for everyone here today. Has there been a time where you anchored yourself to salvation? Has there? Has there been a time when you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and committed to follow him? Because listen to me, listen, in churches all across America, even Central Church, there are people, you've gone to church your entire life, you dress really nice, you think you're a really good person, you are a really good person. But, but here's reality, you could die today and bust hell wide open because you're depending on your works and not the work of Jesus Christ inside of you. Have you committed your life to Jesus Christ? That's the most important question you could ever be asked. I'll give you some time to think about it, and I'll ask it again a couple more times. Let's keep reading. We'll flip over to Mark chapter 3. Verse 13 says this. They've all been together following him, and it says this. Jesus went on a mountainside and called. Everybody say called. Called. Huge, huge. And called to him those he wanted. Everybody say wanted. Wanted. And they came to him. This verse blows my mind. If you're a Christian, you know why you're a Christian? Because Jesus called you. You know why he called you? Because he wanted you. Because he wanted you. Again, this blows my mind. I remember the first time that this truth came to me. I, I, was, I was reading one day, and it just hit me. Oh, I didn't choose Jesus. Jesus chose me. Now, I know there are some people who will argue, no, I chose Jesus. No! You choose whether you want a T-bone or a porterhouse at Borden Arrows. That's the kind of choices you get to make. You want a porterhouse every time. So I just made that choice for you. You don't even get to make that choice, I guess. I just made it. The reason, listen to me, the reason we're Christians is at some point, Jesus Christ knocks on the door of your heart, and we say, yes, Lord, yes, I will respond to you. So again, let me ask you this question. Has there been a time in your life where you've said, yes, Yes, Lord, has there been a time where you responded to him knocking on the door of your heart? Because here's the deal. I, I believe this. this. This is one of my core convictions. I believe he gives every one of us a chance. I do. I believe he gives every one of us a chance. So has there been a time where you said, yes, Lord, I'm responding to the call of your life, and you anchored yourself into salvation? The Bible says he called those he wanted. Verse 14, he appointed 12 designating them apostles that they might be with him. In other words, our first call as followers of Jesus is to be with Jesus, is to follow Jesus. Not, not kind of like, yeah, I accept you and I'm gonna go my own way. It's not go around the board and get your get out of hell free card. Because I, I know I've had people tell me, well, I prayed the prayer and I kind of just go and do my own thing and whatever happens, happens because I know I'm getting into heaven. Listen to me. If that's you, if you can say that, if you can receive the grace of God and then, I don't know, give God the middle finger for the rest of your life, 
My question is, did you really receive his grace? Look, did you? Did you really receive his grace? Or did you just do something to make yourself feel better in the moment? If you can really, really, really look at the death of Jesus on the cross and say, oh, yeah, Jesus, thanks for that. Not going to hell. Sweet. Woohoo! Now I'm going to go out and I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to have sex with whoever I want to have sex with. I'm going to smoke whatever I want to smoke. I'm going to drink as much as I want. And at the end of the day, I'm just going to pray a prayer, and you have to forgive me. If, if you can say that, I would say that your main problem is you probably don't know Jesus. And I hope that scares the hell out of some of you today. Let's keep reading, verse 14. That they might be with him and that he might send out, send, send, send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12, verse 16. These are the 12 he appointed. Look, look at this, this is so important. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. In other words, he changed Peter's name. When Peter, when, when, when Jesus first meets Peter and they first get together and he calls him, his name was Simon. But Jesus changed his name to Peter, which is symbolic of the fact that you and I, when we meet Jesus, when we become Christians, we cannot stay the same. Jesus changes us. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. We are made brand new. And this is so huge, and this is something we have to grasp, that that when we're anchored in salvation, that Jesus changes us. He changes Simon's name to Peter. Please don't forget that. We'll come back to that later on. Um, But before we get there, as we're going through this, if you look at Peter's life, all right, look at the fact that Jesus changed him. If you read through the Gospels, you read in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, Peter Peter has some incredible highs and some incredible lows. I mean, Peter, he got to go up on this mountain one time, and it's, we, we call it the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus, like, transformed into his eternal glory. It was, like, incredible, man. It was this really cool deal, and Peter got to see that. Peter got to walk on water. Peter preached some sermons. I mean, Peter got to do some incredible, 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 incredible things. Peter's actually the guy that confesses that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus comes to him one day, and he's like, hey, man, who, who are people saying that I am? And he's like, ah, some people say you're this guy. Some people are saying this guy. Some people are saying this. And he's like, no, Pete, who do you think I am? Who do you say that I am? And he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, you are right on this rock. I'm going to build my church. It's that, that, whole, that whole story right there. And, and that's incredible. Like, that's, that is just like, that is like, whew, that is like one of the pinnacles of Peter's life. He had some incredible highs. But he also had some incredible lows. Peter? When he tried to walk on water, if you know the rest of the story, he actually sank. There's a time where Jesus gets so mad at Peter that he looks at him and he calls him Satan. Now, I've thrown out some pretty good insults in my life. I can tell some pretty mean yo mama jokes, all right? I got all that. I never called anybody Satan, ever. Jesus calls Peter, one of his closest followers, Satan. That's pretty much the valley right there. Right? When, when Jesus calls you the name of his like, arch enemy, right? I mean, seriously. Peter had some incredible highs and some incredible lows. And in Mark chapter 14, Peter does something that I, I would argue that every one of us have done. Let me tell you why we wrestle with this question of can I lose my salvation. Some of us, you're, you're at the place where you're a Christian, um, but you, you've done things that you know, or you're doing things that you know, like just it's not right. Like, it's just not right. And, and you're convicted of it, but you do it again. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you're a Christian, you're a Jesus follower, but you've done something. You're just like, man, I know that's not right. And, and, and you're convicted of it, but you do it again. And you're convicted of it, and you do it again. And it seems that there's this pattern going on in your life. You just can't get out of it. It could be sexual sin. It could be gossip. It could be an addiction. I, I, I don't know. We could list all those things out. But, but there are some people, listen to me, you know Jesus, You know for a fact there's a time in your life where you anchored yourself to salvation, where you received Jesus, but you feel trapped. And you're like, man, I started doing this, but but I I can't quit. I just can't stop. I don't know how to get out of it. And there's genuine conviction inside of you. And you've been told by people. You've gone to people. You've gone to other Christians. You've gone to other pastors. You've gone to places, and, and, and you've told them. You've confessed, and you've said, man, I'm struggling with this, and this is what they have told you. Well, if you were a Christian, 
A true Christian doesn't struggle with sin. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. But you begin to believe that because you're seemingly trapped in this and and you're convicted of it. And you're like, I'm sorry, man. And you keep doing it, right? And so what you do is we begin to make promises to God. I don't know if you've ever done this before, but I've done this. I've said, Jesus, I promise I'll never do this again. You ever done that? Jesus, I promise I'll never do this again. And then you do it, right? Jesus, I promise I'll never do this again. And then you do it. Jesus, I promise I'll never do this again. And then you do it. Jesus, I promise I'll never do this again. And people are telling you, hey, if you're praying that prayer, that's probably because you're not a Christian. And and so you're like, Jesus, I can't stop. If I do this again, just please kill me. And then you do it again, and you're like, I was kidding about the don't kill me thing, right? Like, don't don't kill me. Like, don't do that. I was emotional. But you, you know what I'm saying? We begin to pray ridiculous prayers and make God promises that we cannot keep. That's what Peter did. Look what he did. This is huge. Verse 27. Just as Jesus talking, he says, you will all fall away. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. He's, he's quoting the Old Testament. They will be scattered, but after I have risen, he's saying, hey, don't freak out. It's going to be okay. You're going to scatter, but I'm going to come back. After I have risen, after I have risen, you will, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Look at this, verse 29. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Uh, can you imagine the other disciples when Peter stood up and said that? Peter's like, hey, huh, Jesus, I don't know about these other fools, man, but listen, I'm with you, Jesus. I'm your boy. Remember that time up on that mountain when you got all glowy and everything? Remember that time we walked on water? Re- remember that? Hey, Jesus, I'm with you. I'm never going to fall away. I'm your dog, man. <laughs> and there are people here that are just like this. We've made the decision to follow Jesus, and we've said, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. I'm going to follow you forever, always and forever, no matter what. Jesus, me and you, we're tight. And listen, we know we've made that decision, but at times we have fallen, right? Jesus comes back at Peter, and look what he says, verse 30. I'll tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. In other words, he's like, (laughs) Peter, come on, dude. I know you. I know who you are. I created you. I know everything about you. I knew when, you call, when I called you that you were going to deny me. Peter, I know. That's the same message he has for many of us today that feel trapped. We know that we've received Jesus, but you feel caught up in that sin or that pattern of sin. And Jesus is not surprised. He's not. He, he's going, I know. I knew that about you. I'm not surprised by what you're doing. Yes. It grieves me. Yes, it breaks my heart. But I knew you were going to do that when I saved you. The Bible goes on to say this, but Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Remember that. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Peter made a promise that he would never, ever, ever deny Jesus. But we know he did, don't we? We know he failed. In fact, let's look at that. Verse 43 Just as he was speaking, this is talking about Jesus, just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders. So Jesus is out with his disciples. This is after the Last Supper. This is after all of that. And they're out there in the garden to pray. And here comes this big crowd to arrest him. Now the betrayer, that's Judas. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him, and then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. (laughs) Now, we all know in that verse right there, that was who? Peter, right? Peter. Verse 48. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. And then look at this, verse 50. This, this is one of the most horrific verses in the entire Bible to me. Verse 50, then everyone deserted him and fled. Everyone deserted him and fled. Thomas, James, John, Andrew, Peter, all the guys that said, I'll never deny you. I'll always be with you, Jesus. I'm all, even if, to the point of death, I'm with you, dude. All of them denied Jesus in that moment. That's what sin is. Sin is when you and I 
willfully and knowingly denied Jesus. Now, if you're in this pattern, because a lot of people go, well, Ryan, once again, somebody that knows Jesus, I mean, somebody that knows Jesus, they're never going to deny him. They're never going to struggle with sin. And there's some of you that come from a background that teaches you. If you struggle with sin at some point in your life, it's probably you lost your salvation. But listen to me. I've taught this before. There's a difference between struggling with the same sin and desiring to be rescued from it. We're all going to wrestle with it. Do you desire to be rescued from it? If you're wrestling, listen to me. If you're wrestling, if you're struggling with sin, let me tell you why you're wrestling and struggling with sin. Because you went through the same pattern. I, I've, I've done this before. We'll go through the same pattern that Peter went through when Jesus was arrested. He ran. He ran from Jesus. And if today, if you're doubting your salvation, here's the one thing I know about you. If you're doubting your salvation right now, you're actively running from God. You are actively running from God. And you're like, no, I'm not. I'm sitting here in a church service. You're not being honest. You're not being honest with me. You're not being honest with yourself. And you're not being honest with God. Listen, there are people every single week at this church who are running from God. And you know what's crazy about that? You can't outrun him. You can't. It is impossible. But Peter, Peter ran from Jesus, and then he did something else. He did something else that when we deny Jesus, we always do this. Look at this, verse 53. And they took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, elders, and teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance. I won't get too close. I won't get too close, man. If I get too close, I could get killed. If I could get too close, they could crucify me too. If I get too close, they're going to label me, and so I'm just going to stay back here. Followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. Look at this. There he sat down with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. He sat down with the people who came to arrest Jesus. In other words, he sat down with the enemies of God. And the one thing I know about you today, if you're a Christian but you're wrestling with sin, is you're running from God. And you're beginning to warm yourself by the fire with people that are also running from God. It's a natural progression. As we walk away from God, as we walk away from Jesus, we walk away from Jesus, and then we always walk away from the people that could support us in our walk with Jesus. That's what Peter did. Look what happens, verse 66. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming herself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. What is sin? Sin is when we deny Jesus. Peter obviously sins. He denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she signaled to those standing around. This fellow was one of them. Again, he denied it. What is sin? Sin is when we deny Jesus. Sin is when we say, Jesus, I know what you want, but this is what I want. I'm not going to do what you want because it's not the most convenient thing in the world for me to do right now. Now, quick, quick question. Was Peter a Christian? Was Peter a follower of Jesus, yes or no? Yes. I showed you in chapter 3, Mark chapter 3, that Jesus wanted him that Jesus called him, even though he knew that this right here was going to happen in his life. Look at this. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them. And that's horrible, because in that culture, if you call down curses on yourself, basically you were saying, yeah, I don't, I don't know him. If I do, send me to hell. That's pretty, pretty huge sin right there. I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time, and then Peter remembered the word that Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. Look at this. And he, this means Peter, and he broke down and wept. Peter denied Jesus three times. And the third time, he calls down curses on himself. But the key, here's the key. Here's the key. Because some of you are like, Man, this, this is bad. Like, how, how, do, how do we fix this? Like, how do, how do I know? How do I know I'm a Christian? The key is found in that last verse, the last part, verse 72, where the Bible says that Peter broke down and wept. If you're a follower of Jesus and you begin to sin, there's genuine conviction inside of you. There's something inside of us when we sin that just says like, ah, oh, something's, something's off. Something's not right in my soul. And, and, and if you're here and you can go out and sin 
but experienced no conviction? One more time, let me say it. Let me be honest with you. Reality is, you've probably never met Jesus. You probably don't know Jesus. You've most likely never anchored yourself to salvation, and I would wrestle that to the ground today. So two realities, quickly, I want you to leave with today. Number one is I'm a greater sinner than I ever thought. I'm a greater sinner than I ever thought. One of the problems that exists in the church world is that we don't think that we're that big of sinners. We think all the sinners are outside of the walls, right? We're obsessed with their sin, but not our sin. Like church is the only place in the world where a glutton can look at a drunkard and say, sure, I'm glad I'm not him. Where a drunkard can look at an adulterer and go, at least I'm not doing that. Where an adulterer can look at a gossip and go, okay, I'm having sex with somebody I'm not married to, but at least I'm not talking about that person over there. Church is the only environment in the world where that happens because we compare ourselves to one another. But listen, if you want to play the comparison game, if you want to compare yourself to somebody, let me ask you this question. How righteous today are you when you compare yourself to, uh, I don't know, Jesus? Seriously, if you go back, if you go back and you read the scriptures, Genesis chapter 3, you know how many sins it took to separate mankind from God? You know how many, you know how many sins it took? One. The whole fruit thing, remember that? One sin separated mankind from God. One sin did it all. Which, by the way, if one sin can separate us from God for eternity, then one sin could re-separate us from God for all of eternity if losing your salvation was possible. We're sinners, and every one of us are a greater sinner than what we think. Some people say, Ryan, I'm not, I'm not. (laughs) You're going, I'm not that bad. I'm not, I'm not that bad. And the reason we claim that we're not that bad is because we know somebody that is way worse than we are, and we always compare ourselves to them, right? But once again, compared to Jesus, how good are we? Listen to me. We're not saved because we're good. We're saved because Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid for our sins. And every one of us comes to, needs to come to the reality today that we're greater sinners than we ever thought. But the good news is, number two, he's a greater Savior than I ever thought. Jesus is a greater Savior than I could ever imagine. And again, when Jesus saves, he saves completely. Listen, for those of you, let me kind of walk through this. There are some people wrestling with whether or not you're saved, and you're like, all right, Ryan, I know I'm a Christian. I know there's been a time when I've received Jesus. I know I made that commitment, but G- but Ryan, man, I'm, I'm in a place I'm not proud of. I've walked away from Jesus. Like, like I've walked away from the people of Jesus. And Ryan, I'm like Peter. I'm warming myself by the fire. I'm denying Jesus. I'm living in sin. And Ryan, I just don't think that Jesus loves me anymore. Every one of us, I have to tell you this, and you have to get this. Jesus loves you no matter what. No matter what. That's the message of the cross. The message of the cross is not, I love you if. The message of the cross is, I love you, period. Jesus Christ loved us enough to die for us, even though he knew every single thing about us. And so if you're here and you're caught up this morning and you're like, there's no way Jesus loves me. Ryan, look at all that I've done. Ryan, I can't receive Jesus. Look at all I've done. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But Ryan, I'm doing this. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But Ryan, you don't understand. I'm caught up in no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But you don't get it. I'm running. No condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, if you are God's child, you are God's child, and you will always be God's child. That's great news. I'll close like this. Chloe and Jaira, they're my kids. They'll always be my kids. There's nothing that they can do to make me say, you're not my kid anymore. There's nothing they can do to make me stop loving them. There's no mess they can make. There's no situation they can get themselves in. There's nothing they can do to make me deny that they are mine. He's my little boy. She's my little girl. They will always be, and I will love them always and forever no matter what. That's the message that God has for every one of us. If you're in Christ, if you're a follower of Jesus, you belong to him. And I don't care how messed up you think you are. I don't care what big of a mess you think you're in right now. If you repent of your sin and you come back, he will clean you up. And over time, over time, 
in his time. He will change you into who he has called and created you to be. And so if you're here and you feel like, I'm not good enough, you know what? You're right. But Jesus is good enough, and that's good enough for all of us. He paid for our sin on the cross. He's a greater Savior than we could ever imagine. And so today, one last time, have you said yes to Jesus? Have you? Because once you're anchored into salvation, you're anchored into salvation for eternity. Let's stand and sing.